Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. And this leads to the rise of Jesus' fame in the area. In verse 28 of chapter 1, it said, His fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Verse 33 says, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. This is in chapter one. Jesus becomes so important to the people in that region that by the end of the chapter, Mark says, Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Verse 45 of chapter one. And so chapter two begins with Jesus returning as it were to civilization, so to speak. But the excitement of the people has not waned, and that's very clear to see in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. We'll notice in the next coming weeks, actually I started preparing a whole sermon on the preaching ministry of Jesus yesterday, and that wasn't where I intended to go. And I had already notes that that wasn't intent where I intended to go. And then I thought to myself, how am I going to preach what I intended to preach? And then this whole sermon on Jesus' preaching ministry. And then I decided I'm going to wait a couple weeks until chapter 3, which will probably be more like uh, a few months. We'll see how things work out. But for now, I want you to see what Jesus is doing. Jesus is preaching. And I thought about this when Brother Jim finished his reading. I thought about having you all remain standing and I would sit, because that is most likely what Jesus' preaching was, how that was happening. He was sitting, and the people were standing around him. There was standing room only in the home. At the home is what uh, the text says regarding where Jesus was, and there's differences of opinion as to what this means. Uh, very simply, we know that Jesus was in Capernaum a lot. We know that Simon, Peter, and Andrew had a... A home there and Jesus came there at the end of chapter 1 and healed Simon's mother-in-law and so we do believe that perhaps this is where his home base was whatever the case was he had a place that was familiar to him that he was received he was welcome and he was at home there and that's where he was and the people were gathered around him there in that place they were he there I want you to know to hear Christ preach but where Christ preached he also healed we see that in chapter 1. Christ is teaching in the synagogue. There's a demon-possessed man, and that demon cries out, What do you have to do with us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so the teaching ministry, the preaching ministry of Jesus, often was followed and often gave reference to the, the miracles that he worked the miracles undergirding his word in that sense. But the first point this morning I want us to consider is the forgiven sinner, verses 2 through 5. And they came, verse 3 rather, they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, when you read those verses or you hear them read, what's the first thought you have in your mind? Most likely, it's not sin, right? You don't hear those words and think, well, this man needed forgiveness for his sins. That's the point. That is exactly the point. As we read this text, it's natural for us to think, wow, this guy needed to be healed. 
He's a paralytic man. He can't move. He has four friends or four relatives. They let him down through. You imagine Jesus is preaching and somebody is digging on the roof. This morning, if somebody was doing that, how many of you would just be like, what is going on in this place? Right? Sometimes we get to be to where we could never perhaps imagine God working in a way that he does work in history. Four men digging a hole in a roof. But we don't often, when we read this text, we shouldn't actually, when we come to these verses in our minds, think, oh man, this, this, this paraplegic or this paralytic man, man, this paralyzed man, needs to be forgiven of his sins. Paralytic means generally one that was paralyzed or even a quadriplegic, somebody who could not move without assistance. He was at least unable to walk, perhaps unable to move. I know somebody very close in this condition. It's uncertain what causes this condition in those days. There are several ways that a person could become paralyzed, as we know now today. And it's not important or it's not necessary to the narrative. But we know that they had to get to Jesus because the crowd was so full, there was no room to enter into this home, which in those days was pretty much a small, single-room structure. But in all of those structures, or as they were conjoined with other buildings around them, there would be a stairway access to a rooftop. The stairs, if you could imagine it, in Kauai, we have lanai's. The stairs would lead up to the flat roof, which would be to these people a form of a lanai. This is where people would go and spend their comfortable moments together. If it was hot inside and it was cool in the evening, they'd go and they'd rest up in the evening. This is why in the Old Testament, it was a law that Moses prescribed for the people that they had a banner. banner a, a, that's not the right word. They had basically a protective gate surrounding it so people wouldn't fall off the roof. And so there were stairs that would lead to the roof and this is where the friends go and they go up to a flat rooftop that was basically beams overlaid with sticks and then clay and thatch and things that would make a soft or soft or a flat surface to walk on. It would be sturdy enough to walk on and spend time on, but you would hear people up there if you're in the house and then these people start digging away the clay or the tiles. There's some difference whether some houses had tiles, some had clay, some had clay and tiles at the time. So they made a big enough hole so that they could let down their friend through this hole. And verse five is important. When Jesus saw their faith, and the question comes to mind, did Jesus see their faith by their efforts to bring their friend? Our faith is a fruit, or our works are a fruit of faith. But we also know some works are dead works. Some people do good works without any faith, they do good works for their own self-aggrandizement or glory or whatever reason they may have. They don't always do good works because they have faith in the Lord. So was their faith something Jesus saw in their efforts? Some scholars say yes, that must be what Jesus is referring to. Or does Jesus see in their works a fruit of faith within them? We know that in this context, Jesus knows the hearts, the thoughts of men. This is one of the great evidence of Jesus' divinity, by the way, because only God knows the heart. Men can practice all sorts of activities and confuse and fake people out, and the hypocrite is well received, usually, by those around him, because they don't know the heart, but God knows the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God knows the heart. Jesus often displays this knowledge of what's in man's thoughts, what's in their hearts. Of the scribes, he says in verse 8, and immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit, that is not in the Holy Spirit that dwells in him or on him, who rests on him, but his own spirit, that they thus question within themselves. And he said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? They thought, well, he's blaspheming because of what he will say. So we have within the context of this narrative the proof that Jesus knew the hearts of men. That's a scary thing. 
Some of you out there are very happy that I don't know your heart, or your person, your, your friend next to you doesn't know your heart, or God forbid your spouse doesn't know your heart. God does. And the Lord knew the hearts of those that were around him. And it's my conviction that these men were known of Christ outwardly and inwardly. Jesus had already been preaching the gospel of the kingdom at this time for some time around the, the region of Galilee. There, it, it is certain to my fallible knowledge that these people who lived around Capernaum had either heard Jesus preach or heard others tell of Jesus' preaching. And these were some of the faithful of Israel who believed the promises that God gave to Abraham, who believed the promises that there would be a prophet greater than Moses. There were some in Israel who were waiting for this Messiah. And they hear this news and it's my belief that Jesus is speaking not merely to faith as an outward action, that they believe that Jesus could heal their friend, but that Jesus was the Messiah. Why do I believe that? Well, for those reasons also. But Jesus had been preaching these things. He'd been preaching repentance and faith. But Jesus says something to them that indicates that more is at stake than just their faith to see their friend healed. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now our sins are not forgiven because we do good works. The fact that Jesus is focused on the passive man in the narrative. This is a man who hasn't done anything. He's laying on his bed. He can't move. And Jesus' is, Jesus is proclamation of forgiveness comes to the one who isn't working. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, who among us, the first time we would have read this text, some of us are so familiar with these texts, we know the end before the beginning, right? We come to the text, we say, oh, that's the, the text about the paralytic man that Jesus forgives. But who would have among us read those first three verses, three through five, and said, oh, his great need is his forgiveness of sin? As I said, we need to read this in some sense, remembering that Mark is writing this to Gentile people, probably in Rome, who are reading this narrative or hearing this, hearing this narrative read to them for the first time, and they're saying, well, this paralytic man is being dropped down to Jesus, and then Jesus forgives him? That's a strange order of things. But don't miss the order of things. Because the order of things in this narrative is an order of importance. Remember going to school, order... Uh, chronological order, all those different orders you learn. Well, this is order of importance here. Jesus sees this man, he sees their faith, and he gives per forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. The insertion of forgiveness here and this topic should take our breath away. The same slap in the face reaction should hit us every time, in a sense. Paralyzed people, we think, need to walk. They need to be healed. As a priority, that may be our great inclination. But the priority of Jesus is the main point of this text. The prevailing idea among the Jews at that time was that those which such a debilitating physical ailment, a serious physical illness like this, were being judged by God for their sin, a particular sin that they committed. Some believe this in part because of the curses that, that God promised to bring upon Israel if they were unfaithful or rejected his covenant in Deuteronomy 28. You can read about the blessings and cursings there of covenant faithfulness or covenant unfaithfulness. But those curses that God promised to bring about Israel would be a sign of judgment upon Israel in general, 
not merely or not necessarily meted out on individuals because of particular sins that they may or may not have taken part in. Because those sins could be covered. They could repent of those sins. They could cover those sins with the sacrifice of faith in the promises of God covered by the means of the atonement sacrifices and the sacrifices of a guilt offering and sin offering. God made a provision for those who had sinned to sacrifice of faith, to bring a sacrifice of faith so that those sins would be covered, so that a one-to-one -one correlation between somebody's suffering and sin is not necessarily what the point is of those curses in Deuteronomy. But it became the tradition in Israel. We see that in John chapter 9, a man born blind, and they come to Jesus and say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because he was born blind, they assumed that there was a one-to-one -one correlation with his condition, his blindness, and his sin. And Jesus dismisses that, and he says, no, it's not because of either of those things. It's because this reason right here, me before you, who will rid this man of his blindness, cause him to see, and you will see the glory of God displayed in me. That's why he was born blind. In other words, God has purposes that we know not of when it comes to illnesses, trials, hard conditions, the condition of this paralytic man being one of them. But to the people's mind, present there, they would have thought this man must have been a great sinner to be in this condition. He must have been a great sinner. And so in fact, what may surprise us, because everything in our modern day is about fixing physical problems or momentary affliction or temporal ills, we don't often have our minds set on things above. We have our minds set on things on this earth. And so first place for us, we're shocked why would he forgive his sin first? But to them at that time, they would have said, yep, that's his greatest need. But that's not actually what we read by some of the people here, is it? They would not have seen or heard Jesus say, pronounce this blessing or actually give forgiveness and said, praise God. Some of them we know did not agree with the psalmist in Psalm 32.1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count iniquity. The great doctrine of imputation. That God will not count our iniquity against us, for he counts his righteousness as ours. He forgives us. By the way, that is not passive. He doesn't pronounce forgiveness upon us merely in someone's name. He is actively, authoritatively forgiving us. He is, in, in effect, judging us forgiven. This is what Jesus is doing in the text. And I say not everybody received that with the hearty amen because of what we read next. Number two, forgiveness of sins is God's prerogative, verses six through eight. The shock of the exchange between Jesus and the paralytic man does not go unnoticed by some in the audience. And Matthew, Luke, they tell us, Matthew especially tells us that the powers that were over the people of Israel, the, the religious authorities had already heard of the commotion in this region of Galilee and had sent religious leaders there to witness what was happening. This is be common in those days. And they go and they send scribes, authorities, legal authorities, law authorities, mosaic law authorities to this place. And those people are not happy by what they've just heard. We read that in verse 6 through 8. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts why, and I want you to think about this word. It, it seems like it's insignificant. Why does this man... And notice how that's set off. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, 
Why do you question these things in your hearts? Now, we, as we read this, we can find fault with the scribes too quickly if we're not careful. Jesus does not contradict them. Notice that here. He does not contradict them that only God can forgive sins. Blasphemy, they believed, and I believe rightly at this point, is in essence to deny God what is rightly his. His prerogative. We read in Jude and in 2 Peter that to judge apart from the judgment of God is not our prerogative. It's not even the prerogative of angels to do that. It belongs to God. Blasphemy is in essence to deny God what is rightly his, whether worship, attributes, his rights, his will be done. Daniel 9.9 9 says, To the Lord our God, Adonai, our Elohim, belong mercy and forgiveness. To him belongs these things. For we have rebelled against him. When it comes to sin and the forgiveness of sin, only God has the right. Not merely to pronounce sin, but to give forgiveness. When it's sin against him. Notice, this man had not sinned against Jesus. They, there was no history. Jesus is giving a forgiveness for his sins. Jesus does not say according to the word of God or something to that effect. He merely asserts that the man's sins are forgiven. Beloved, Jesus knows their hearts and will demonstrate why he has the right to forgive sin, but in doing so, he doesn't contradict them. He corrects them by teaching, rather, who he is. And this is the important aspect of this narrative. Jesus doesn't say, no, not only God has the right to forgive sin. In fact, he corrects their view about him. What did they say about him? This man as if he's just one of a multitude of men. Third, the son of man with power, verse nine through 12. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, what's happening here is sort of an irony, isn't it? Jesus says, what is harder? And that's sort of an irony. Because it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, obviously, right? That's easier to say, but to us, the statement to the paralyzed man, take up your bed and walk, that's impossible. But what he's showing is that in fact, it's absolutely impossible to say to a fellow person with our authority, your sins are forgiven. He's actually showing by the lesser healing the man how impossible it is for us to forgive sins by our own authority. Because they can understand it's impossible for them to say, take up your bed and walk and have that happen. They can see the authority in that. So Jesus is showing them by that lesser miracle that he has the right to forgive sins. Because what are they gonna do? What is their reaction? They are all amazed, right? At that authority, three observations from what happens here. First, the miracle demonstrates Christ's own power to forgive sins. Now, we don't believe that we can look at a person's physical problems and pontificate that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between that and some sin that they committed. That is a dangerous thing to do, and I warn you against that. You see your brother or sister suffering, 
and you say, well, they must have sinned in some way against God, be warned that is not a biblical judgment for you to make. But we can say that all physical suffering is at least in part due to the fall of man in Adam and the subsequent curse that God placed upon his creation. Therefore, Christ's ability to alleviate the power of the curse of sin in the form of this man's physical ailment is a demonstration and an encouragement, therefore, for our faith that he in himself has the authority that belongs to God to forgive sins. You see, if he can lift the curse of sin, he is showing that he has the authority to actually forgive sin in this narrative. The second observation, notice that in both cases, the power is expressed in the words of Christ. What does he say? Which is easier, which is easier to say to the paralytic? And then he says, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. What does he do? Sins, he said to them. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. I want us to see in this the authority of God's word in regards to our salvation. Paul says the gospel, which is a pronouncement of good news concerning the Son of God, that he died for sinners, he was buried and he rose again and he ascended to the right hand of the Father, that is a word. And it is a word, according to the Apostle Paul, that is the power of God for salvation. You see, we're coming in on the Reformation Day, right? And part of that Reformation movement was that not only God's word is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice for the believer, but at, that it is the power of God for salvation. Beloved, we need to reverence the word of God. Jesus is speaking here. And his words, as we saw last week, have the, have the power to create in us Fishers of men, I will make of you fishers of men. They have the power to save sinners. So many of us can so easily be distracted by the formalisms of religion. The forms of religion. I believe in the coming years, in the coming next generation of the, the life of the church, one of the degrees of difficulties for, for us to labor against will be formalism. You see, because what we were previously have been fighting against was immoral activity. And that's what we're currently waging war against. But often these wars that we fight within the church to contend for the faith, they seesaw back and forth like this. They go like this and they seesaw. And so now we may have to stand in this moral age and say, no, you cannot choose whatever lifestyle you want to live and say that Christ is Lord of your life. You cannot choose a sexual sin and say Jesus is okay with it and still call Jesus Lord. We, we're standing on that ground now, but it may be in 10 years that the ground we're standing at is that you don't merely come and say, I'm baptized and I'm trusting in my baptism, or I'm trusting in the reception of receiving the Lord at the table, the formalistic things, and say, I'm saved there, and not in the crucified Lord himself. Because so often we turn from lasciviousness to legalism, from a formlessness to formalism. And I want us to hear in this, salvation comes through hearing, and hearing through the word of God. Faith is a response, it's a gift of God that responds in us to the word of God and that is where salvation rests. We are justified by faith alone, through Christ alone. 
And I want us to see that. All Jesus does is speak, and the man is changed. All Jesus does is speak, and the man is forgiven. And we know that that forgiveness is contingent upon his death and his resurrection, but he is justified because he's believing in the word of God. Do you believe the word of God? Third, the son of man with power. This is what I've called this sermon, and I want you to grab this point. Notice what Jesus says. The son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This title was Jesus' favorite title with regards to what he called himself. More in, in, in all of the Gospels, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man than any other title. And I often think that we, we bicker back and forth, what does it mean? Some people mean that it, it has re reference to his humanity. We believe that Jesus is truly man and truly God. And some people say, well, it references humanity and Son of God references his deity. When we come to the scriptures, I think we have to be more exact. And this context is one of those examples for that. The, ex the context of why Jesus refers to himself as Son of Man here is very important. In the context... This is a direct response to the doubt in the minds of the scribes regarding the pers of person of Christ. Remember what they say, and they doubt in their minds. Why does this man speak like this? And as I said, that term man is very important to us understanding what Mark is describing here. The answer that this man is God in the flesh, in fact. This is why Jesus does not contradict them, but rather explains to him who he is. In light of their assertion, therefore, only God can, for, can forgive sins, Jesus, to that assertion in their minds, to that question in their minds, says to them, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He doesn't say, no, you're wrong. God has power to forgive sins and I have power to forgive sins. He says, the son of man has power, authority on earth to forgive sins. Why make these distinctions? Why draw in them him speaking about himself in this position where he has is that without contradicting them, he's saying to them, you don't understand who I am. In other words, the title Son of Man in this context means something like, here I am, God in the flesh, I have authority here to forgive sins. Not merely to pronounce sins forgiven in God's name, but to say to this man, this is the force of the language. Jesus is not merely pronouncing sin. He is giving forgiveness. He is claiming in doing so something about himself in this context. And we'll see more about this title of the Son of Man as we go through this gospel. But I want us to see what is happening here. He doesn't contradict them. He says, in fact, what you're seeing is the power of God in front of you in the person of the Son who became flesh. I'm getting so excited for Christmas lately. I've been thinking of all the Christmas narratives. Ye yesterday, I went, or one of these days, I went to Walmart and I just said, yeah, skip right over Halloween. They got all their Christmas decorations up. At some point, that will grieve me in the spirit because all that nonsense, you know, that we are distracted by. But I just love the Christmas season. The incarnation. God becomes man in the person of the Son. And I really believe this is what we need to see when we see Jesus forgiving sin. Only God can forgive sins and only God in the flesh is doing that in this narrative. 
In closing, let's see this response in verse 12. An enigmatic response, I take it. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed. Jesus tells him, get your bed. <laughs> Jim was mentioning before the service. You know, he doesn't even walk in. The, the four bring him in on his bed. And Jesus heals the man and it's like, see, I don't just forgive partially and I don't just heal partially. He tells the man, pick up your own bed and leave. Now, now you're not depending on these other people to bring you around or your bed. It's time to get responsible, pick your bed up and go. And that's what he does. He picks up his bed and he goes out before all of them. And can you imagine this crowd of people that's so crammed in this space? They had to make room. People had to leave, no doubt, the building. And then they must all just, like the Red Sea, part out of his way. Because <laughs> they're amazed again. And so they were all amazed and glorified God. We don't know if the scribes are part of that all here. But they were all amazed, glorified God, and they said, we never saw anything like this. Now, the reason why I say this is enigmatic is because when we go to John and we see how the, the crowds believe Jesus, but then Jesus knows their hearts, and he knows that this belief was not saving faith always. But they glorify God for the works they saw. But how about you? What is this narrative about? Do you hear it and delight in the prospect of having our health problems solved? Could you use someone like Jesus to help solve your money problems? Those are not evil concerns in themselves. Do you need him to give you wisdom for your children? That's good. What do you seek in Jesus? Are his gifts your greatest need? Who wouldn't want to be healed from their ailments? I would. I suffered with sleeplessness for two years. Sometimes I still do. That was a scary thing. Every day thinking, will I sleep tonight? I don't know if the PTSD or whatever I had after all those floods, but my adrenaline would get going and I wouldn't know if I'd sleep at all. And then you don't know if you can, you know, conduct yourself with any sort of intelligence or responsibility because you're not sleeping. You don't know if you're going crazy in your mind and all of these things. That's what I really need. No. That's not what we really need. We don't need the clothes, new clothes every week. We don't need... Our house is being nearly as big as they are. We don't need all the food that we get. I made some food the other day. We had chicken, we had fish, we had anything we want. Just go to the store, get it, have people over, we fellowship. It's not our greatest need. The text is about displaying God in this person. The faithfulness of God in a person. The power of God in the person. The authority of God in the person. The mercy of God in a person that walked the earth 2,000 years ago like you and I do. Who came to seek and save the lost. Who came to give himself a ransom for sin. To save his people from their sin. This text is about deliverance from the curse of sin. It's about forgiveness of sin. It's about God saying, your sins are removed from your account. That's what forgiveness means. To put away from Jesus is telling this man, your sins are not counted against you anymore. That's what we need. Before anything else, we need to hear the words of God. You are forgiven. And here is somebody who came with that authority in himself. 
to bestow on sinners forgiveness. And the text is about displaying not just forgiveness, but Jesus, the one who forgives sinners. So if you see in this text an earthly chance to change your health, your marriage, your relationship with your children, stop your anxiety, sleep better at night, or even just get help with your immediate sinful temptations, you may miss the good news of this text altogether. In a sense, while we are on this earth, we will suffer persecution. We will experience trials. And if that's what you gather as good news alone or in the first place, you will be disappointed. But if Christ is beneath you in all of those trials, one thing I learned through those trials of a few years was that I may take Advil for a headache, but it's just a covering. I may, I may uh, do all sorts of activities to correct my health, but they're just temporal. In, the, in that span, I had knee surgery. <laughs> Tomorrow, who knows what else is gonna come? The Lord knows. As I was telling Kyle, the old confession, the Heidelberg Confession, the first question is, what is our only hope in life and death? And the answer is that we both belong to God, both body and soul. You know how you belong to God, both body and soul? You believe the gospel. You believe in this person. That's the gospel of God. That's Romans 1, 1 through 3. The gospel of God concerns this person. It's not just because of the miracles, although those show that he is true and he's real and he's all powerful and he's able to save us. We should rejoice that this man is able to make all things new, but it's in him. We cannot be like so many of the Jews who started seeing that the altar, the gifts of God, were the things they came to and not the one on the altar who is greater than all the gifts. We must receive Christ as he is revealing himself to us in the scriptures, in the word of God, as the God-man, the one who has all authority in himself to forgive sins. And we know that's necessary because he himself goes to the cross bearing his, our sins on his own body there. And if he can't forgive sins, that will not avail us. But if he can, if he bears the sins, then he bears them fully. If God imputes his righteousness to us, if he counts his righteousness ours, that's called, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the righteousness of God. Not a lesser righteousness. You see, it's in the person of Christ that our hope is grounded. And my concern is this. There will always be religious people who are fine with you doing approved sorts of physical good, but will hate you in the name of Christ. Isn't that, you said, what, really? Jesus said, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things, listen to this, because they have not known the Father nor me. These people said Jesus is blaspheming because they didn't know him. Do you know him? Do you trust in him? He is the word of God. He is the gospel. In him is forgiveness of sin. Listen to this, beloved, the text is about the forgiveness of sin that come through faith in Christ alone. And listen to this, only God can forgive sin through him. And I didn't misspeak. Only God can forgive sin through him. Him. There is no salvation 
in anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God will not forgive you unless you receive his son. As you see him, as you hear him, as you behold him, as he is revealed in the word of God. And this is good news for you because he is here for sinners. If you're here today and you go, this is, uh, if God, God knows you. You're not tricking God and for you to say, oh, I'm too great a sinner. God knows the depths of your sin. He sent his son in the flesh because he is a great savior and able to save you. Nobody is outside of his reach. He is absolutely sufficient to save you. Will you hear him? Do you believe? If so, I want to give this benediction to those who believe already. Sometimes we wait till after the song, but I want you to hear this. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. let's pray. Father.